Well, we're back in Genesis. If you'd like to turn there to chapter 1. As you're turning there, we're going to look at verse 21. Let me tell you about it, though. When something is a masterpiece, it is usually signed by the artist or by the author or by the producer of the work of art. What we're looking for is the indelible signature of the designer, of the Lord himself, across the pages of this universe he made. And I'd like to just pull out for you one little part of Creation Week. Look at verse 21. Just the last part of verse 21 I'm going to emphasize. It says, So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind. Now look at this. This is fascinating. And every winged bird according to its kind. Uh, That's not very much space given to one of the most remarkable facets of the world, of the animal world, of creation. Flying wedges, living wedges, which defy gravity, are one of the most beautiful signatures of God. God has written his creative signature across this world. The heavens and the earth are crying out in testimony to him. I want you to check out the signature of God across one special part of our world. And I want you to see that this special part, the bird kingdom, could no way have come into existence except by the finger of God. What do I mean by that? Well, just for starters, if you were to open an ornithology book, that's the big word for studying birds, you know, bird watchers, ornithologist. If you were to open a bird book, and study how birds are designed, you and I, if we think about it, would say, how could those possibly have ever evolved to be like that? This is an example. The exact, absolutely unique way that birds adapt to the air as flying wedges. They swim through the air the same way that birds can fly through the water. You see, what do you mean by that? Well, they're both Effortless, if you've ever watched them. You ever watched a fish? I, I used to have an aquarium, and I'd stand there, and, and I'd get down at the fish's level. And then without moving a muscle, it would go straight up to the top, and I'd get up there. And then, have you ever seen how fish, they don't move anything. They're just, I mean, they're, they got that little, whatever these things are, just going like that. But they don't seem to exert anything, and they can just go up and down and move around effortlessly. I mean, I'd like to have that ability. Can you imagine if you could just go up to the fifth floor, you know, just without even moving a muscle and instead of waiting for the elevator and all that stuff or climbing the steps? But uh, they are listening to their designer. They are designer-dependent creatures. Birds cry out the need for an intelligent designer as much as we saw in the weeks past fish do. But look at the end of verse 21 again, and then I'm going to describe one bird. Now, there are thousands of different variations, but I'm going to describe one. The end of verse 21, it says, And every winged bird God made, every one of them. First among the awesome fingerprints of God upon birds are their shapes and forms. When Jesus drew attention to his listeners and told them to look at the sparrows, he was pointing at himself. Why? Because even the lowliest of all birds have such symmetry, architecture, and engineering that it would be impossible to duplicate and replicate today with all of our supposed advances. Because even the most lowly or common of the bird family are more advanced aerodynamically than our fiercest and most advanced fighter warplanes. A bird has been well designed by scientists as a living wedge. If you could sail alongside a bird in flight and notice its form as it flew, you would be witnessing from beak to the last tail feather an absolute study in complete streamlining. That bird can batten back its feathers and totally be like every fighter wish it could be stealthy. A bird can float through the air like the down of a milkweed pod and yet weigh as much as 20 pounds. I mean, have you seen any shot puts sailing through the air looking like milkweed pot? I mean, when something weighs 20 pounds, it, it just falls. How can birds, especially when there's a current of air, how can they just float? I mean, I, I used to love to go up in the mountains when I was down in Georgia. We'd go up in the, 
in the Smoky Mountains, and we would watch. And when you're sitting on a mountain, the air currents are going. You could see birds just actually sitting right out there. They're just not moving. They're just floating on the air. They're just riding those air currents. How do they do that? The scriptures tell us that God made them. And God made every part of a bird's framework, its anatomy, and even some of its quills. God made them hollow and air-filled. Now, this week in science, we're studying Charles' Law and Boyle's Law. Man, I didn't even know about Charles and Boyle, but I'm learning this week, you know? And you know what it says? It says that a gas, as in air, is reciprocal to the outside temperature around it, and its volume will be totally tied to the temperature around it, okay? And the other law is the pressure around it. Well, when something gets warmer, it expands, and when something gets cooler, it contracts. Now, with that in mind, listen to this. A bird's body has such a higher body temperature than we mammals have. And the trapped air is heated inside of those quills and inside of its bones and inside of the air pockets in its body. And so much like the hot air balloons that float all around the sky sometimes here in Tulsa, The air trapped inside of these birds, heated by its body temperature, causes there to be a a difference in its atmospheric buoyancy. And so a bird becomes just like a hot air balloon. And it actually has buoyancy on air like it would a duck have buoyancy on water. And God actually built that inside to it. The air trapped is at a higher than atmospheric point of buoyancy, and so the bird actually is able to float with very little air pushing it up in the air currents. Now, think about that. How do the water birds, which are made the same, I mean, if you go duck hunting and and looking for geese, how do those things, which can just sit like grease on water, how do they get down to the bottom? I mean, they're like corks. And how do they get down to the bottom so easily? Well, when you think about the hollow air-filled design of these birds, you question how they can sink to the bottom and feed off the materials they need for life. And probably there's no more vivid signature of God on any bird than there is upon a bird which is ideally fitted to float on air, to act like grease on water, and yet it can dive to the bottom and eat off the bottom of the riverbed I'd like to introduce you to one bird that lives in the Pacific Mountains. It's called the Pacific Oozel. Most of you probably never met an Oozel. Uh, not an Oozie. Uh, we wouldn't want to meet one of those. But you would want to meet an Oozel. Out west, where the streams run fast, where the waters are cold, they run white with the foam of waterfalls. If you were to watch closely, you would find God's witness to creation. The Pacific Oozel. Of all the birds that have ever been cataloged by ornithologists and studied None of them have more hollow spaces and are more buoyant than this one bird. This is the absolutely most buoyant bird that they've ever found. It has more air than it does mass and, uh, and material in its body. And like grease poured onto water, it floats above even the roughest waves at the base of waterfalls. If you look closely, the oozel is not like a duck. I don't... You know, if I had water right here, a duck sits in the water. You ever seen it? You know, they're kind of about this much of them are in the water. And geese, too. If you look at geese and swans, they're kind of sitting down in the water, and they, they kind of have about that much in the water, and their feet are going. An oozel doesn't get in the water. It actually sits above. It sits on top of the water, literally. It looks like smoke on water, if you've ever seen one. It looks like a little puff of smoke, and it just, it just moves around like a like one of those hovercrafts, you know, it's just on top because it's so buoyant, it can't actually even go into the water, it just sits there. And looking closely, seeing it floating above the water in contrast to the partially submerged bodies of ducks and geese. But if you were to take your binoculars and look at one oozel floating out there by a rock in a stream by a waterfall, if you watch carefully, you'd have to try and figure out where it went. Because oozels that are floating above the water disappear. And all of a sudden, about two minutes later, if you watch closely on the bank, it'll come wading out of the water. It's actually walked underwater. Now think about that with me for a second. This bird drops straight down to the bottom of the stream like an oversized lead sinker on a boy's fishing line. 
and it hits the bottom. And if you could see, as the National Geographic scientists have with their underwater cameras, you would see that that oozel is calmly walking with its feet on the bottom, and it's walking along the bottom of the stream bed against the current. Now, wait a minute. We're talking about a milkweed pod fluff that floats on top like smoke. How did it feed on the bottom on its favorite delicacies as firmly as if it was made of lead? How can this possibly be the most buoyant bird and yet walk through the current of a stream on the bottom? It fills its beak up with all the little critters down there that it likes to eat, and then it wades out of the water onto the stream bank, lifts its head. By the way, almost all animals lift their heads, as it were, to their creator as they thank him for their food and swallow it. And then it just shakes off, and you'll see it back like a puff of smoke back on the top of the water, bouncing along. How does it do that? Well, this happens because its designer installed special equipment in the oozel. It has strong muscles surrounding its body so that at will it can completely exhale all the trapped air in its body. It just goes basically and squashes it all out so that it has no buoyancy, absolutely none. And it can walk totally through a current because its mass is enough to hold it down on the bottom of the riverbed. Now, the question is, how could a bird that can float like a cork or sink like a stone at will ever have evolved by chance? No human, no, no member of the human race could even conceive or design or modify such an apparatus as this lowly member of the bird class. Yet in the beginning, God, in a moment of creation, designed the magnificent Pacific oozel and countless other marvels that fly about our planet. And each of them, as they float about this earth, are declaring the glory of God, their creator. We'll turn to the right, to the book of Job. That's just four psalms. I want to show you why some of you don't like birds, probably. And you say, why did you spend all that time telling us about oozels? Well, because the Bible said we should. Job chapter 12, right in the middle, if you're new with the Bible, if you open it right in the middle, you should be in the Psalms, and it's to the left. It's back a little bit from the Psalms. And it's the 12th chapter of Job, verse 9. And this is what it says, Job chapter 12, verse 7 through 9. Okay, it says, Now ask the beasts, and they will teach you. And the birds of the air, they will tell you. Verse 8 of chapter 12, Or speak to the earth. It will teach you. And the fish of the sea will explain to you who among these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this. See, that's why science is so neat. You look at the birds of the air. You look at the creatures of the sea. You look at the very earth itself. And then look out in the vast expanse of the universe. Every part of God's creation has his signature across it, and every part is declaring the glory of God. Now, turn back a little bit more to the book of Nehemiah. And I want to worship our Lord God Almighty. And this, by the way, is the longest prayer in the Bible, for those of you that like, you know, trivia. This is the the longest prayer of all the recorded prayers in the Bible. It's prayed by Ezra and the Levites, and it's recorded by Nehemiah. And it's in chapter 9. And all the great prayer chapters, uh, Nehemiah 9, uh, Ezra 9, Daniel 9, are the three key prayer chapters. In the Bible, they're all chapter 9s. And let's worship the Lord as Nehemiah records this praise to our Creator. Verse 5, halfway down, starts the prayer. It says, Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. Uh, You know, that's significant because uh, if you know anything about this, this was read before the gathered nation, and they heard the word of God. In fact, they stood from morning to night, and they wept and prayed. And so at this moment, he says, stand up. must be that some of them had sat down. Blessed be, continuing in verse 5, your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessings and praise. Now look at verse 6. You are alone are the Lord. You have made heaven. You didn't, you didn't wind it up. You didn't send it off by other agency and means. You personally, the scriptures say, God, you personally made the heavens and signed each part. Now, for just a second, we have a 
one or two billion dollar submarine called the Sea Wolf. Your your dollars and my tax dollars have paid for it. Did you know that is such an intricate submarine that every machined part of it has to be signed by the machinist on the metal that he made that part. That's how, I mean, when you build a $2 billion boat, every piece of it, when we were in Rhode Island, they were building them. They, most of the people worked for, for that company. And, and there was such pride in making the most expensive object ever made on earth that they had to sign each piece. I mean, when you machined a piece, well, if, if machinists get to sign pieces of metal that they shape in a whatever, Look at this, verse 6. God, you alone are Lord. You made the heaven. And God just happens to have signed everything he made, too. And that's what we're looking at, his signature. The heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth, everything on it, the seas and all that is in them, you preserve them all, and the host of heaven worships you. Well, that's our, our focus The signature of God of cross-creation should cause us to realize how great thou art, O God. How incredible is his power. And then as we're going to see, there's only one place in the entire cosmos that people could live. Scientists have just concluded with all their supercomputers that there's only one trillion of one trillionth of the universe that is habitable for human life. And you happen to be standing on it right now in the whole known universe. There has to be 23 different scientific properties available around a place for there to be life. And this is the only spot right here where you stand on this planet where all 23 anthropic scientific properties are present in the whole universe. There's nowhere else that the sun is the right distance, it's the right luminosity, it is at the right stage, that the planets are at the right distance from the sun, that the air pressure, that the revolutions, that the rotations, that the tilt of the axis, that the specific gravity between carbon dioxide and oxygen, and even the content, this is the only place in the universe that life, human life, can live scientifically. And secondly, God put us here by his design. Let's worship him as we bow Creator of heaven and earth, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as you, O Son, spoke all into existence at the Father's will, and as the Spirit of God hovered above, overseeing the creation, we marvel. We are in awe that you've put more into a lowly bird than all of our scientists collectively have been able to produce yet. And you put so much more into us because you have actually signed us with your spirit. We have the anointing, the signature of God, your Holy Spirit. You love us so much, you've actually moved inside. And you dwell in us. And you know us completely. And because of that, we are in wonder. And we say, what do you want from us, O God? We give ourselves back to you. We worship you. And we want, as we worship you, to serve you. I pray that you would refresh, renew, and refocus our hearts back to our Creator. That as we worship you, that the service in this world, in our jobs, in our homes, in our communities, in our marriages, that we would offer that acceptably to you. We'll thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You might wonder why we're covering creation for so long. There's two very strong statements in our doctrinal statement that anybody that is a member of Tulsa Bible Church has affirmed. I'll read those to you. It says, Thus we teach the literal, grammatical, historical interpretation of Scripture, which affirms the belief that the opening chapter of Genesis, which we're looking at, presents creation in six literal 24-hour days. We believe that strongly. That's what we teach. That's what our members affirm. That is very, very important as we spent five weeks doing it. A little bit later in our doctrinal statement, it says this. We teach that man was directly and immediately created by God in his image and likeness. Directly and immediately. Not, did you find out they found a new Asian subspecies that's earlier than the African species that Dr. Leakey has been digging up for the last 50 years? 
And now they're just gyrating over trying to figure out how this new monkey man fits with their plan. We don't believe in any of that. That is after the fall. That is the decline and fall of man, all those cave dwellers. Man did not dwell in caves in the beginning. He dwelt in cities, Genesis said, with musical instruments, making uh, metallurgical arts and, and raising crops and sheep and and everything else and, and making musical instruments. But we believe man was directly and immediately created by God in his image. Man was created free from sin with a rational nature, intelligence, volition, self-determination, and moral responsibility to God. End quote of our doctrinal statement. That's critical. We don't believe there was a whole world of destruction, dinosaurs running around eating people, and people beating each other and pulling around by the hair in caves before Adam and Eve. Because Jesus didn't believe that, and the Bible never teaches that. So we don't believe it either. And that's why this is such an important study. And we looked at, in the beginning, God, the, the seven Hebrew words that translate into our ten English words that are the most important words in the universe that tell us God originated all things, and God has intervened and has entered into the creation as a man and has offered salvation. Then we looked at God created the heavens, and the scriptures tell us, in fact, if you want to uh, back up to Genesis 1 with me again, I'll remind you of something which blessed my heart this week. Uh, at, at one moment in Genesis 1.14 of creation week, this is what it says, and I, I underline this for you in your mind, but maybe you didn't hear it, and so I'll underline it a second time. Peter, you know, repeated himself all the time, and so do I. God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. And then he talks about verse 15, all that. And look at verse 16. God made two great lights. Greater light, our sun, to rule the day. A lesser light, the moon, to rule the night. Remember I told you to underline in your mind the last part of verse 16? He made the stars also. Now think for a minute. At one moment in creation's week, God says there were stars visible in the sky over the earth. Why would he have just lightly mentioned that? I believe for two reasons. One, to show his power. Because up there, one of those twinkling dots that Adam would have seen in the sky when he first turned his gaze heavenward would have been the Andromeda galaxy. And on that instant, what Adam, would have, without God's explanation, would have thought was just another star was actually a hundred billion stars swirling in this massive galaxy, two million years away of light, if the distances are that great out there. No one's been out there, and they can't really tell except by derivation, mathematically, how far everything is, but two million light years away and gazillions of miles away. But when he saw that, God just spoke into existence and all of those stars and galaxies and clusters of galaxies just appeared. That's astounding. That shows God's power. An object 10 quintillion miles away and 2 million light years away was visible instantly. But that's not all. It was to show God's glory. You all know Psalm 19.1 that says the heavens are shouting. In fact, that's the first verse you have to learn in Hebrew class. Weilala, leilala, hashemayim mesaprim kavodel. The heavens are declaring the glory of God. And the word declaring is shouting and screaming. The whole heaven, the cosmos, the heavens above are screaming down on us, the glory of God. The spaces out there that seem limitless, the sheer number of stars, galaxies, the swirling energies beyond our comprehension, yet God named each star and each are obediently following their creator and each one declares that the creator wants to meet you and has offered himself. Well, I want to take you for the next 13 minutes on a journey. I want to show you how not only the Pacific oozel, but everything about the, the climate, the, the planet, the atmosphere, the specific gravity, the ratios of the gases, everything on this planet has the signature of God on it, that he wants us to be here. Let me show you what I mean. Starting in Isaiah, and we're going we're gonna to cover a lot of stuff. Isaiah 40. And get your Bibles ready, because we're going we're gonna to cover about 20 verses. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 22, I already quoted to you as you're turning there, that God made all of the universe for his glory. Psalm 19.1 says that the heavens 
declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. But Isaiah 40 and verse 22 says this, that God stretched out and unrolled the universe for his glory. This is what it says. It is he, Isaiah 40 and verse 22, who sits above the circle of the earth. By the way, Isaiah wrote this 7th century B.C., said the earth was a circle. You know what a circle is? It means it's round, right? We're not flat earthers. We believe it's round, always have for since God made it. Uh, but he sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. Look at this. God stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. You remember when we started this series, I told you about when we go camping, I kick the tent and it unrolls. That's what God did. He just kicked the universe and it unrolled out to wherever the furthest limit of it is. Why? Well, turn back to Psalm 95. And you probably know this territory well. Back to the left. Psalm 95 says that, that the creatures might worship him. God created the heavens screaming his glory. God unrolled the universe and sits above the circle. All of us are like grasshoppers down here. And what he wants to come up from the grasshoppers is worship to him. I, I mean, if some people, they just say, I don't have anything to do. I'm so bored with life, you know, and it's just, oh, I just got to have some excitement. Well, why don't you just tune your, your dish upward and just spend some time every day worshiping God? I mean, that's what he made you for. Psalm 95, look at verses 3 through 7. Psalm 95, 3, for the Lord is the great God. And the great king above all gods, in his hands are the deep places of the earth, which, by the way, science cannot even remotely get close to. They have no idea. I mean, hear all the speculation over the, the earthquake in Los Angeles. Was it an aftershock of the land earthquake, or was it a new series? And is the Bay Area. I mean, just all the speculation. They don't know what's going on under the surface of this planet. No one knows anything about anything deeper than nine miles. The earth is 8,000 miles thick. We know about nine miles. That's like the, the thin skin on an onion. We know nothing about this earth. But look what it says. Verse 4, in his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. Verse 6, O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand today, if you'll hear his voice. Harden not your heart, as the writer of Hebrews said. What does God want? He wants us to worship him. Look at the next psalm, Psalm 96, just on my page right across the column. Verse 4, for the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the people are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. See, this is a big thing to God. I mean, if the tri or the sea wolf makers get to etch their signature, actually their number, their general dynamics, you know, Groton Sea Works number on their parts that they make, they don't really get to put their name, they just put their badge number. But God said, This is a big deal for me. I have signed my name on you. I made you. I made the heavens. Look at Psalm 113 to the right. Just keep going. Psalm 113, verse 4. The Lord is high above all nations, verse 4 says. His glory is above the heavens. I mean, we think the heavens are astounding. And, and the new X-ray telescope is showing so much more about the beauty, the symmetry, the order. It's, it's profound. But God says, my glory is above the heavens. I'm, I'm so much better and glorious and powerful than the heavens. Those are just an expression of a creative moment. And God says, I'm infinite and endless. And I just spoke that into being. That's just the word of my power. I'm greater than that. Verse 5, who is like the Lord our God, who dwells on high, who humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and the earth? Did you know it's a humbling thing for God to even pay attention to us, but he loves us so much he does. Well, now in your minds, change gear. What are the chances for finding a planet like the one you're sitting on that supports life? Well, astrophysicists, scientists, mathematicians have all gotten together, and they have started to run the numbers on how, in the evolutionary framework, how it's possible that it just happened here. Okay? Now listen, this is their findings. 
there are 23 parameters that cannot be exceeded without disturbing any planet in the universe's capacity to support life. There are, 20, there, are, there are a minimum of 23 elements that must be present for life, us, to live, to begin, and to continue to live, okay? Not to mention there are about a dozen other parameters, such as as, uh, atmospheric transparency, pressure, and temperature gradient, and greenhouse gases, and location of gases, and minerals, and mantle, and core constituents, and structure that are currently being researched for their sensitivity for supporting life. Do you see? I mean, they said there's 23 prime ones, and there are a dozen others. They're not even sure. Probably even the core of our planet influences the viability of this planet. But... With considerable security, we can draw the conclusion that much fewer than a trillionth of a trillionth of a percent of all stars out in the universe could possibly possess, without divine intervention, a planet capable of sustaining advanced life. Now, that's an evolutionary mindset thinking, a trillionth of a trillionth of a percent. Considering... The observable universe contains less than a trillion galaxies, and each has only a hundred billion stars. We can see that not even one planet out there anywhere could be expected mathematically by natural processes alone to possess the necessary conditions to sustain life. So mathematically, I always think about what William Proxmire said. Remember the great, I think it's from Washington State, kind of had some great things he said along the years. He said, we have spent over 100 million Dollars of American taxpayers' money searching for intelligent life forms in the universe. He said, I think the money would be better spent looking for some intelligent life forms in Washington, which is true. I mean, why don't they get down to business and try and solve our problems instead of waiting for some Galactica ET message to solve our problems? We've already got it. And by the way, I have a copy right here if maybe you'd like to see it. This is the true message from God. But these factors seem to indicate that the galaxy, the sun, the earth, and the moon, in addition to the universe, have undergone divine design. And if divine design is essential to explain the properties of simpler systems, such as the universe, our galaxy, and the solar system, how much more necessary is God's involvement? Explaining systems as complex as microorganisms and animals and plants and the highest of all God's created order, human beings. Astounding. Well, you're in Psalm uh, 113. Turn over to Psalm 147. Let me show you the first one of these anthropic, by the way, the, the terminology for this is anthropic principles. That means that everything mathematically and scientifically points to the fact that this place we live was designed just for us to live in. It didn't happen. It didn't, you know, slowly get that way. It suddenly became this way, or else we wouldn't exist. Okay? Psalm 147 says this. He counts the number of stars. He calls them all by name. Verse 4 of Psalm 147. Great is our Lord. You know, every time it talks about his creation, oh, the psalmist can't help but breaking out into praise. Great is the Lord. I mean, he gets so excited. So should we. Mighty in power. He understand, his understanding is infinite. Verse 8. Who covers the heavens with clouds. Who prepares rain for the earth. Who makes grass to grow on the mountains. Verse 9. He gives the beast its food. And to the young ravens that cry. Verse 16. He gives snow like wool. He scatters the frost like ashes. Verse 17. He casts out his hail like morsels. Who can stand before his cold. Verse 18. He sends out his word and melts them. He causes his wind to blow and the waters to flow. Point number one of the anthropic principles of our world, God perfectly ordained at the moment of creation the number of stars in our planetary system. Now, any of you that have, you know, wasted your time and gone off to watch movies about science fiction, how many times do you see a double? I mean, that's the neat, you know, special effects. They have two suns. I think that's in the most recent uh, Star Wars thing. Two suns out there. Did you know that life could not exist if we had two suns? So there's an anachronism, scientifically, or or worse than that, a faux pas of Mr. Lucas's design. Why? Because, listen to this, if there was more than one sun, the tidal interactions would disrupt the planetary orbits. 
two massive suns out there exerting gravitational pull would, would make the Earth's orbit not be able to be so perfect 365 and one quarter days around it, or its revolution, not its orbit. If less than one, in other words, if we had less than one sun, if, if we were sharing a sun, and here was our solar system sharing it with this solar system so that it was not central to our solar system, if we didn't get the full benefit, then the heat produced would be insufficient for life. You get it? It takes eight and a half minutes at the speed of light for the radiant heat and light to jet out from our sun and cover 93 miles to get to us. And if we were recipient of two suns, it would burn us up and would ruin our orbit around it. And if we were recipient of only half of a sun because it was shared, we wouldn't get enough to stay in existence. Okay, turn to Psalm 148, right across the page in mine. Look at verse 1. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him from the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Verse 3. Praise him, sun and moon, all you stars of light. Praise him, you heavens of heavens. Okay. Are they? Yeah. Did you know that God perfectly ordained at the moment of creation the mass of our sun? If you study astronomy very much, you know that our sun is kind of normal, average, right in the middle. And they get hotter and smaller. And they get cooler and bigger. And if we didn't have a yellow, middle-aged, by star chronologies, sun, if it was bigger and pumping out more, we'd be fried. If it was smaller and pumping out more, we'd be incinerated. If it was bigger and waning, we would be gradually going into ice ages. You see... If our sun had a greater mass, the luminosity of this star would change too quickly and it would burn too rapidly. And, and if it was less mass, the range of distance appropriate for life would be too narrow. And the tidal forces, the, what this is saying is if our planet, with all this water, you remember 70% of the surface of the earth is water? If you move the planet any closer to the sun, the tides would inundate the land because there's more water than there is land. And so our Earth cannot get any closer to the sun. And it can't get any further away. It's just locked at the right distance. God, at the moment of creation, perfectly ordained that. Turn back to Psalm 74. Here's another thing. By the way, the psalmist didn't even know that the scientists were going to make this list, and yet he comments on all of them. Isn't that interesting? Shows that maybe the designer had something to do with writing this book, you know? But um, Psalm 74 says, verse 16, The day is yours, the night also... You have prepared the light and the sun. You have set the borders of the earth. You have made the summer and winter. Let me just read some of these principles. God perfectly ordained at the moment of creation the distance the earth would be from the sun. If further, our planet would be too cold for a stable water cycle. Do you realize that? We have to have the right global temperature for this water cycle, for God to, to clean the air and drop the precipitation and to wash the land, go to the oceans, evaporate up and condense back down. If it was a different mean temperature of this globe, if it got colder and colder, we would not have a stable water system. If closer, our planet would be too warm for a stable water cycle. Everything would stay up there. It would never condense back down, and we'd go back to the, to the vapor canopy deal. God perfectly also ordained the moment of creation, the gravity level on the Earth's surface. We call that the escape velocity. If the gravity on the surface of this planet was not such, what would happen? Listen. If it was stronger, our atmosphere would retain too much ammonia and methane, we'd look like Jupiter. If it was weaker, our planet's atmosphere would lose all the water and we'd look like Mars. God made the escape velocity of this planet. By the way, another interesting thing is that oxygen uh, or carbon dioxide is lighter, CO2, than breathable air. You say, so what? Well, think about it tonight when you go to bed. You know how many gallons of air you breathe all night long as you're snoring away, or you probably don't snore. I don't think I do either. I've never heard myself snore. But while we're in there breathing, do you realize how many gallons of air? And if all of our exhaled carbon dioxide did not rise, we would suffocate every time we went to sleep. We'd have to all sleep on top of our house breathing so that by the morning, all the carbon dioxide wouldn't drown us. God designed that. Can you imagine how many humans evolving, died in their own carbon dioxide till evolution switched around and made CO2 rise? 
that, maybe that's where all those cavemen came from. I don't know. Uh, just teasing. Next, God perfectly ordained the moment of creation, the color of our sin. You say, what do you mean? Well, if we were around a red sun, the photosynthetic response would be insufficient. In other words, your plants wouldn't grow, and mine wouldn't either, and wore our food. If we had a blue sun, the, the photosynthetic response would also be insufficient. We have to have a yellow sun, and God knew that. Isaiah 51, 13 says, You have forgotten the Lord your Maker, who stretched out the heavens, who laid the foundation of the earth. You have feared continually every day because of your oppressors. When you have a maker who made even the color of your son exactly right. Well, God perfectly ordained at the moment of creation the brightness or the luminosity of our sun. He also ordained the tilt of the earth on its axis. I mean, if I was making this thing, I I like everything lined up. You should see. I mean, my pens, I have them all lined up in my my books. I'm always fiddling around getting them all straight. I mean, I even when I uh, help... You know, fold clothes. I love to just fold them just right so they'll be stacked. You know, I mean, I like lines. I mean, it's tilted. I, I'd go and fix it, you know. At the moment of creation, God tilted the earth on its axis. If there was any greater tilt, the surface temperature differences would be too great. In other words, it, we would go from, from 120 to 20 below because just that tilt has so much to do with the radiant reception of energy from the sun. If less, same thing would happen. We would have such diverse temperatures on this planet that we would have super storms. I mean, you think it's bad enough in Oklahoma. I don't think so. They only have those out in the far ends of Broken Arrow, not where we live. We don't have any bad thunderstorms and everything where we live. But God perfectly ordained the time it would take for the earth to rotate. If it took longer for our planet to rotate, the diurnal temperature differences would be too great. As I mentioned, if shorter, the atmospheric wind velocities would be too great. God perfectly ordained at the moment of creation the strength of our magnetic fields. I mean, have you, have you thought about the magnetic fields lately? I haven't. But if there were stronger magnetic fields, the electromagnetic storms would be too severe for life to exist on this planet. We would live in a constant, you know, class six thunderstorm year round. It would be hard for life to go on. If... If it was weaker, then the land would be inadequately protected from the hard stellar and solar radiation. You see, the magnetic fields kind of work like repulsion of all those bad rays coming toward us. God perfectly ordained at the moment of creation the thickness needed in the Earth's crust. If our crust was thicker, too much oxygen would be transferred from the atmosphere to the crust. If our crust was thinner, the volcanic and tectonic activity would be too great. And they would really be getting it out in California right now. God perfectly ordained at the moment of creation the ratio of oxygen to nitrogen in the atmosphere. If larger advanced life functions would proceed too quickly. In other words, you'd light a match and it would burn right down if there was too much oxygen. I mean, you would light your charcoal and go like that in a, in a oxygenization, in a total oxygen heavy. That's what happened. Remember in the Apollo where there was a spark and it burned those three astronauts to death? Too much oxygen, the whole planet would be like that. Well, let's turn to Psalm 139 and close, okay? I could go through the other 16, but they all say the same thing. They say that everything on this planet was designed by a designer, okay? God perfectly ordained at the moment of creation the anthropic design of this planet. What does that mean? It means we're unique. We're here because of God's sovereign plan. And it means that we are eternally, incredibly valuable to God so much he has signed his name on us. What do I mean by that? Well, let's just just close with the psalmist's words. Psalm 139. This is what he says. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. He says, God, you know my location all the time. You know the GPS deals, everybody likes those because we like to know where we are. You know what's better than knowing where you are? God knows where I am. GPS, God's positioning system. If God knows where I am, I want to be where he wants me to be. And I want to get my, my monitor uh, or my, my antenna up to make sure I'm where he wants me to be and yield it to him. You understand my thoughts are from afar, verse 2 says at the end. That means my meditations are open to him. Hey, you know, there's this super secret place they found that's been monitoring all of our telephone and radio transmissions, and now they say it's even doing our emails, and there's these fiber optics, and oh, it's just a big deal, and they're spying on us. Hey, 
God's been spying on your thoughts. Every, he doesn't miss any. He doesn't need a computer to sort them out. He reads them, knows them, and even inhabits them. That's powerful. Look at verse 3. You comprehend my path and my lying down. You know my destination. You know where I'm headed. You are acquainted with all my ways. You even know the intentions of my heart. Verse 4. There is not a word on my tongue. But behold, Lord, you know it all together. You inhabit my conversation. You know my words before I speak. Verse 5, you've hedged me behind and before. You've laid your hand on me. What does the psalmist say with this amazing, unique identity we have that God knows and understands everything about us? What does the psalmist say? Verse 6, he was overwhelmed. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high. I cannot attain to it. What does this mean to us today? Well, it means that God is such a perfect designer. He designed a spot in the universe that one trillionth of one trillionth of all the stars couldn't support. We're unique. Then he designed a system where we could live. And then he designed this super special communications gear for us to be able to communicate with him. And then he revealed himself to us in a book and even more powerfully in a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, I bought you with a price. Therefore, I want you to glorify me in this body that I made for you.